Hi and welcome to the We Are Zion Sermon Podcast. We are a local church based here in Chennai, India. I am Christine, your host. We are so glad you are here and our hope is that this will encourage, inspire and instill fresh faith in you. We continue our series on herd immunity. Here's Christine Geshom sharing today's message. Hi church, what a joy and privilege it is to share the word of God with you again this week. As you know, we've been doing the herd immunity series and uh, we've been looking at how community is so important to God's plan in each of our lives. Um, as you know, we have done how community, when it bears fruit, it's seen in the joy that it, it bears. We also looked at how a community which is gospel centered um, exhibits humility. We also looked at how this community would be uh, filled with the truth and they would speak the truth and love to each other. And this week, we look at how this community would be grace filled. And um, so the word grace is, it's such a, a big word that we all use as believers, but do we really know what it means? Um, before I give you a definition for it, let's get into the word of God. Let's see what the Bible has to say about it. Romans 5 verses 1 and 2 in the NIV version says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. I'm going to break it down uh, by looking at another translation. Let's look at the New Living Translation. This is what it says. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So as we saw in this passage, grace is undeserved privilege. In other uh, definitions, grace is unmerited favor. Grace is called God's riches at Christ's expense. Today, I want to look at grace through the lens of God's generosity. Because the Bible time and time again, especially in the New, New Testament, it talks about how grace is a gift of God to us, freely given. I want us to read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Romans 11, verse 6 says, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What does grace look like to me? What does it look like to me as an individual? This is what grace is. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God given to me for no reason. I didn't do anything to deserve it. Yet I've received this favor and I stand righteous in the sight of God. I stand forgiven. I stand pardoned. That is the beauty of grace. To illustrate what grace and mercy actually look like, I was thinking of this thing that happened in our home about a year back. So our oldest son was gifted a Nerf gun uh, for a birthday many years back and he had lost all the bullets from it. And the, the condition we had given him when he lost the bullets was when you do lose the bullets, we're not going to get you anymore. So you need to keep them safe. That was the condition. Last year around his birthday time, he brought out the guns and he realized he didn't have a single bullet. And so my husband and I felt, you know, it, it felt unfair to just let him have a bunch of guns and no foam bullets. So what we did, we went on to Amazon and we, um, you know, got him a bunch of bullets for the guns that he had. Much to his delight, because he never imagined in his wildest dreams that he would be released from his punishment and that he would actually get some bullets in return. That's exactly what grace and mercy looks like. Grace is undeserved favor, that unexpected gift. Mercy is when judgment is withheld, when punishment is withheld. Just to explain that there are two sides of the same coin, grace and mercy, they, they go together every single time. It's just that grace is such an active um, quantity. Mercy is passive because punishment is being withheld, but grace is active and it, it's, it moves forward. It's God being generous towards us when we deserved it the least. And so where does grace um, make sense for us as a community? We've looked at where it is for us as individuals. Yes, as individuals, because we didn't deserve the goodness of God. We didn't deserve the kindness and forgiveness of God. Yet, when we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what the Bible says. And therefore, that's where grace uh, comes in for us as individuals. But where does grace come in for us as community? Uh, let me continue the story of what happened with our oldest son. So we got him those bullets last year, had went on to have an amazing nerf war fight with his friends. Um, fast forward to last month, our youngest just turned six. And so his uh, one of his uncles got him a nerf gun. 
and he had just two bullets which came with that and promptly one was eaten by the dog and one was shot into a neighbor's yard so our son knew that the the usual punishment for this is no more bullets i have to just have a dummy gun and he didn't even ask us but then we noticed that he was just walking around with his gun in his hand looking really sad and listless so we asked him what's going on why are you so sad and he said i've lost my bullets i don't know what to do so we talked to our son our oldest and said since you have like a pack of 12 why not give him a few or uh, give him one or two because that's all he needs and our son went into this huge discourse our oldest son went into this huge lengthy explanation of how um you know this was hard earned bullets that he had and how this guy needed to be careful that he was irresponsible and so mid mid discourse we had to stop him and we had to say son remember what happened one year back you had no bullets we stepped in and got it for you can't you give two of your bullets to this guy and we had a chance to explain grace to him we had a chance to tell him this is what grace was when we don't deserve something we still get it that's grace and you can show that grace to someone else today grace and community looks like that so often we've forgotten how gracious god has been towards us and so unconsciously or consciously we've held with held it from people let's look at what that looks like in terms of community galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to 8 this is what it says i am shocked over how quickly you have strayed away from the anointed one who called you to himself by his loving mercy i'm frankly astounded that you now embrace a distorted gospel that is a fake gospel that is simply not true there is only one gospel the gospel of the messiah yet you have allowed those who mingle law with grace to confuse you with lies anyone who comes to you with a different message other than the grace gospel that you have received will have the curse of god upon them for even if we or an angel appeared before you to give you a different gospel than what we had already proclaimed god's curse will be upon them it's that simple the opposite of grace is works it's good works even so often we think that is something we did that made us receive the good that we have in our lives we think it's our achievements it's our righteousness oh we have some good in us and that's why god blessed us but the truth is it it's apart from all of that god loved us when we were sinners god loved us and and pours out his blessing upon us irrespective of where we stand on that moral spectrum that's what god's grace looks like and therefore we cannot expect to put these rules and regulations on others and say if you do these things you will experience god's favor you will experience god's blessing because it nullifies the gospel of grace so to summarize the gospel of grace is like this our good works they're like sinking sand but when our lives are built on the foundation of the grace of god we actually stand on a sure foundation it is a firm foundation the reason being so often in our lives we live in times when everyone wants to boast about what they have done how they have achieved it on their own how they are self made but the truth is each of us believers know that we are god made we are god redeemed we are god set apart we are not our own and that everything we have everything we are everything we we are um, do comes out of the fact that we are in christ apart from him we can do nothing and as long as that is the foundation of our life as long as our lives are built on the foundation that were it for the grace of god we are nothing that is a firm foundation to build our lives on and so i want us to look at what one of the greatest barriers to grace today is we have so many things that play in our communities which actually pull down grace which remove grace sometimes from the equation and today we're going to look at how we can actually overcome this one obstacle and that obstacle is forgetfulness like our oldest son forgot how gracious his parents had been towards him how often have we forgotten how just how gracious god has been towards us and the thing is the minute we forget the minute we forget you know sometimes it's a conscious forgetting we you know just we tend to look the other way sometimes it's an unconscious forgetting we forgot just how forgiven we are we forget just how kind god has been towards us that we start being ungracious towards those around us and inevitably it starts to look like pride because we think the reason we are what we are today is because of our accomplishments our giftings our influence we forgot that god is responsible for everything that we are sometimes we also start thinking that if i do more god will bless me more if i strive harder i'll earn more of his favor when in reality i already stand favored before him he already looks at me and says you are approved you are vindicated you are covered 
by the blood of the lamb. You are saved. I love you as you are. We forget that. And so we get so fear driven in our pursuit of God. We say, Lord, I, I, I'm scared that, you know, I'm not doing enough for you. I'm scared. I'm not reading, you know, those 10 chapters a day. What if, what if you're not pleased with me? When he says, I am pleased with you. You are my beloved. You are the apple of my eye. We forget. And so what happens is this translates into our relationships. This pride, this fear, which stems out of forgetfulness, starts affecting our relationships. So what happens, what this looks like is this. We start showing favoritism. We start creating cliques within our church communities. We, we tend to gravitate towards those who dress like us, who sound like us. Sometimes we start avoiding people. We boycott those who don't look the same. We, we say, you know what, they're too complicated. I can't deal with them. Or maybe, you know, they, they're always talking about some issue they have. I don't want that. We steer clear of some people. Sometimes we even turn a blind eye to their needs because we think, I can't get into that mess. We forget just how messy we were. We forget that Jesus not even once showed favoritism. We forget that Jesus didn't avoid the messy people. In fact, he went and dined in their houses. He interacted so closely with them. And so in this journey of knowing God, in this journey of grace that we are all on, we need to look at each other through eyes of grace. We have to be willing to go the extra mile for someone else. We have to be willing to include and be inclusive of everyone. We cannot afford to be exclusive in the body of Christ. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, what does this look like to you? I don't know whether you have these problems. Maybe you're saying, oh my God, that's shocking. I have never done such a thing. But maybe you've struggled with this. Maybe you have uh, controlled someone. You said, you know what, if you do such and such, Jesus will be happy with you. Or, you know, dress in such a way that will please us as a church. We just pushed grace right out of the door. The minute we lay rules and regulations on people, the minute we try to control behavior, the minute we try to control how someone looks and talks, we pushed grace right out of the equation. We've said, you know what, the grace of God has no value. You need to do stuff to please God. Maybe when someone wronged you in your community, you're so unforgiving about it. You're like, you know what? I can't forgive them because it's just too big a thing. I can't. I'd rather wallow in my unforgiveness. All of this stems from fearfulness and pridefulness, which comes from forgetting how gracious God has been towards us. God in his kindness forgave us for every single sin. Our slate has been wiped clean. Why are we not wiping our slates cleaner these days? Why are we withholding forgiveness? Why do we control people with rules and regulations? Today, we're going to look at how we as a community can overcome these obstacles, that we can look beyond, that we can say, you know what, no matter how we look, dress, appear, what our baggage is, we're all one. There are no cliques within a clique. There is no separation, that we will love each other. We won't slander each other. So I don't know where you find yourself in this whole spectrum of forgetfulness. But when I was preparing for this, I was so convicted because in over 12 years of ministry, one thing I've realized that at some point or the other, I've operated with one of these spirits. I've, I've operated out of fear. I've operated out of uh, pride. And I have inevitably pushed people away from the gospel of grace. And today when I was preparing it, the Holy Spirit was nudging me and in saying, you can still walk in grace. It's okay that you fell off the wagon so many times. It's okay that you messed up. Now is a chance to start afresh, to build a community of grace. And so I want to encourage us today, as we step into this place of understanding what grace should look like in our community, can we just quickly spend a minute in asking God to forgive us of any of those areas where that barrier of forgetfulness has stepped in? Maybe we've ignored people. Maybe we've boycotted them. Maybe we have gossiped about them instead of praying for them. Or maybe we gossiped on the, in the pretext of praying for them. Whatever it is, can we go ask God today that he would forgive us? that he would set us free from that ungraciousness that is not of him. Father, we just pray that you will cleanse us right now, that if we have dealt with people ungraciously, that you would forgive us, Lord. And even as we learn how to be gracious like you are, Father, that you will enable us. Holy Spirit, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So how do we as a community better display this grace? The first thing is that each of us must speak with grace. We looked last week at speaking the truth in love. But how do you speak with grace? Let's see what the Bible says. It says in Colossians 4 verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. This is in the context of outsiders. 
coming and questioning you, you about your faith, about what you believe. Instead of getting all riled up, he's saying, hey, here, listen, season your, your speech with grace. So grace can temper us. It keeps us on the ground. It doesn't let us get all riled up and say the wrong thing. Colossians 3 verses 8 to 9 says, But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with his practices in and of our own ability. You know, when we are in the old man, before Jesus entered our lives, all of these were regular happenings. Our emotions must probably were probably all over the place. But now that we are in Christ, we are a new creation. And the, the writer is saying, you know what, put off all of that and embrace the new so that we bring grace into people's lives. Anger, malice, slander, gossip, all of that has to leave. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. No corrupting talk, nothing that's obscene. Nothing that's crass. He says that should build each other up. What you speak has to build someone else up. As a community, in order to break the barrier of forgetfulness, we first of all have to speak to each other with grace. Uh, we live in times where even though we're all at home, we still are so busy. We're caught up with online meetings. We have our seminars, our webinars and all kinds of things. We have our kids' online classes. We literally do not have much time to spare. And so a lot of times... When someone catches us off guard, calls us up, sometimes they do video calls and surprise us, it's very tempting to be curt and short with them. But in being gracious, we actually give people time. Even in a busy schedule, we stretch it out a bit so that we give someone a listening ear, so that we send them that text, wishing them maybe for their birthday or their anniversary. We take that extra time to be gracious. When they talk to us, we don't respond with harsh condemnation, but rather we say, you know what? I'm so glad that God's doing something in your life. He is going to bless you. He's going to, you speak the gospel over them. And that's what exhorting and encouraging someone else with grace looks like. So can I ask you today, would you be ready to speak with grace? It takes a lot of discipline. It takes the Holy Spirit's leading seriously because you're allowing him to respond for you. On our own, the tendency is to be just, you know, sharp. It's to be really short and curt with someone. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, he says, you know what, say this, speak gently, listen to them. Don't judge them. You don't know their story. And so that's what speaking with grace looks like. So the first thing is a community which is grace filled speaks with grace. The second thing about a community that is grace filled is that they serve with grace. What does serving with grace look like? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 and 11 to 12. The grace gifts of Christ. And he has generously given each one of us supernatural grace according to the size of the gift of Christ. Verse 11, And he has appointed some with grace to be apostles, some with grace to be prophets, some with grace to be evangelists, and some with grace to be pastors, and some with grace to be teachers. And their calling is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. And as they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing? These are called grace gifts. Each of us, the, the, in verse 7, it says, each of us have been given a supernatural grace. So the grace upon my life is not even the same as what has been given to my husband. It's not the same as what my parents have. Each of us have different grace gifts and we are called to operate with those. We are called to serve each other with that. It's so easy sometimes to get caught up in what, what we think is our talent and we think, you know what, this talent is great. I should, you know, make something out of it. I should use it as a business model. But what he's saying specifically here is, what is your gifting? It's a gift. It's a gracious gift from heaven. How are you going to use it to edify the body of Christ? So our gifts, the way we serve each other with those gifts, is how we are ultimately tested. It's how we are ultimately evaluated by God. Do I serve with grace? Do I serve with the intention not to be served back, but just as a servant leader to serve with grace? I want us to also look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, every believer has received grace gifts. So use them to serve one another as faithful stewards of the many colored tapestry of God's grace. I love that imagery of a multicolored tapestry. If you look at tapestry, a monocolored one is really boring to look at. Visually, it doesn't stimulate you at all because it's yarn of one, one color. 
But if a tapestry is multicolored, you have so many colors playing up at once. And so that's how we are, as the body of Christ, we are not meant to be clones. We're not all meant to look and sound like robots. We're not like the clone army of Star Wars. We are called to be different as we are. What you bring to the table is what you bring to the table. We cannot morph you into something else. And that's what he's saying. As you come, so you are. So you are used. Your ability is yours. God has given it to you as a gracious gift. He wants you to use it to serve others. This multicolored tapestry means that my my color could be yellow, yours could be purple, if you're going to look at it visually. And what I bring to that design is so unique. It's so me. What you bring to the design is so you. And together we form this beautiful pattern. In the eyes of God, he's creating this masterpiece through the body of Christ. I'm reminded of the story that Nikki Gumbel shares uh, through his Alpha course. So Nikki Gumbel and his wife, Pippa, began the Alpha course in their church in UK. And through that Alpha course, many have been touched by the power of the gospel and many have accepted Jesus. They have been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Nikki talks about uh, this one instance where they did the Alpha course in a prison. And um, these were the two people they encountered in the prison. Brian and his son, Michael, Brian Emmett and his son, Michael, were both in prison after a huge drug bust had gone down in UK. And both of them, they're drug smugglers and they were uh, gangsters in the UK and they had been caught in the drug bust. They had been imprisoned for a very long time. And so they were held at the prison in Exeter in UK when the Alpha course was done there. And it's amazing to know that they both went through the Alpha course. Both of them encountered Jesus in a very personal way. The Holy Spirit transformed them. They experienced the power of the Holy Spirit and their lives changed overnight from gangsters, from drug smugglers to they became men who came under the power of the living God. And this is what they did over time because of good behavior. They were transferred from from one facility to the other. And to every facility that they went to, they carried the Alpha course with them into that prison. Because of them, thousands upon thousands of men were transformed in those prisons through the Alpha course. If that's not a multicolored tapestry, I don't know what is. They took the grace that was on their life. They didn't keep it for themselves. They shared it with others. They served others with that grace. And because of that, the body of Christ was built up. That's a demonstration of this grace gift. That's what the grace gift should do. It doesn't edify ourselves. It's not meant to elevate us. It's meant to serve each other in the body of Christ. So can we serve with grace? Each of us. Our giftings could be different. It could be hospitality. It could be teaching. It could be listening. It could be evangelizing, whatever it is. We don't have to put a label on it. We just have to do what God has asked us to do with the intention to serve the body of Christ graciously. Finally, if we need to be a community that is filled with grace, we must be a community that grows in grace. Are we committed to growth? That's the question. Because the grace that I operated with 10 years back can't be the same stale grace that I operate with today. I should have grown. I must have grown. It's imperative that we grow in grace. Let's look at Ephesians 4 verse 13. It says, these grace ministries will function until we all attain oneness in the faith, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the Son of God. And finally, we become one perfect man with the full dimensions of spiritual maturity and fully developed in the abundance of Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18, he says, But continue to grow and increase in God's grace and intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May he receive all the glory, both now and until the day eternity begins. Amen. In Ephesians 4.13, it's a continuation of the grace gifts. And he says, the reason that you must operate with these grace gifts is so that the whole body of Christ will get, get equipped and we will grow and each of us will then reach full maturity that we will be Christ-like at the end of our lives. And so that's the purpose of growth. Each of us are pursuing Jesus. Each of us are on our journeys, heading towards Christ-likeness as we head towards eternity. But are we really growing in grace? The way I treated people 10 years back, the forgiveness I, I withheld maybe, maybe the control I exerted on them, maybe the way I created clicks within a click that cannot be how I operate today. Now that I know what the grace of God looks like, now that I remember that I can never afford to forget the graciousness of God over my life, shouldn't I operate with a different kind of grace? Shouldn't I exhibit 
a different kind of grace? Shouldn't I share a different kind of grace with others? Are we growing in grace? I want us to read Acts 20 verse 32. It says, Now I'm turning you over to God, our marvelous God, whose gracious word can make you into everything he wants you to be and give you everything you could possibly need in this community of holy friends. 2 Peter 3 first talked about an intimacy with Jesus our Lord. Without the intimacy with Jesus himself and without growing in his word, we are never going to grow in grace. It's interesting how sometimes we think apart from Christ and apart from his word, we can grow in grace just by being around the right people and doing good things. But again, that nullifies grace. It is only in close intimacy, close proximity with Jesus and incredible dependency on his word that we grow in grace. So I want to ask us, are you committed to growth? Maybe you say, you know what, I'm quite gracious. I'm, I'm good. I'm good with people. I never judge them. I never condemn them. I don't put rules on them. I don't stifle them. But hey, have you grown in your grace? Maybe that's who you were a few years back. But are you growing in your grace? Are we committed to growth as a community? Growth in our grace. We cannot be where we were one year back. Our grace should have become more. The way we exhibit grace has to have increased. That's the requirement of us today. So I want to remind us as a community, each of us who are watching, hey, can we dedicate our lives to speaking with grace? No matter how hard our day was, can we extend grace to people who speak with us? Can we extend grace to those who work with us? Can we do that? Can we speak consistently with grace? Secondly, can we serve with grace? Because the grace gifts given to us were not for us. They are for the community of believers. They are for us to equip and empower each other. Can we serve each other with grace? And finally, can we be committed to growing in grace? Not stuck where we were, not content we were with where we were before, but saying, God, Holy Spirit, help me. I want to be more gracious because the kindness of God towards us is immeasurable. The generosity of God towards us cannot be measured. How gracious he has been to us in the past, how gracious he's continuing to be to us today cannot be measured, cannot be quantified. And so let's not even try to quantify our grace towards each other. Instead, let's just be committed to growing in grace. If you are someone who's saying, you know what, I loved hearing about all this, but I don't know how to actually appropriate this grace into my life. I don't know what it means for me. Can I direct you to John chapter 1 verse 17? This is what it says. For the law was given through Moses, but grace, the unearned, undeserved favor of God and truth came through Jesus Christ. I want to ask you today, do you know who Jesus is? Jesus is God. Jesus came down from heaven just to save each one of us. Our lives were riddled with sin. And you know that each of us are so imperfect. But when Jesus came down, his intention was to save us. His, his intention was for us to be restored to God, our relationship to be restored. And when he came down to earth, he just didn't live an apathetic life. He lived a life connected with people. And ultimately, he died and he rose again on the third day. And he ascended into heaven to be with his father. But here's the beautiful thing that he didn't leave us alone. He left us a helper who's the Holy Spirit. And he connects us to God constantly. He reminds us of who he is. And he helps us on this journey of life. So today I want to ask you, are you open to allowing Jesus into your heart? It's a one-time decision. The minute you do that, he comes in, he changes your life. He helps you in areas you're weak. He strengthens you. He builds you up and he carries you forward. You're no longer in a place where you don't have hope. Because in Jesus, you have eternal hope. Your eternity is secure. In Jesus, you have purpose. You have renewed purpose. You don't live for yourself anymore. You live for others. If you want this Jesus, if you want your life to be transformed in the best way possible, can I ask you to repeat this simple prayer after me? Dear Lord, I am a sinner. I am in need of your grace. I don't deserve your favor, but I know that, Lord, in you, I will find that. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you, Lord, that you wanted to save me. And I ask that you will pardon me of every sin and that you will restore me to you. I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
this is the best decision you ever made and we pray that as you journey with Christ you will start to experience his grace over every part of your life for each of us who know the lord for a longer time i pray that we will walk in that grace that we will never forget just how gracious god has been towards us we will never forget that he saved us when we were still sinners and that he has restored us that we need do nothing that we stand righteous before him that we will not put those rules and regulations on ourselves or on others but we'll allow each other to walk in the grace of god god bless you thanks for listening to this message we hope you were blessed to hear more messages like this make sure to subscribe and check out our podcast channel for past episodes if you like what you are hearing consider rating us subscribing and even sharing it with friends that would really help us for more content from we are zion and to connect with us go to weazion.in remember whoever finds jesus finds life